so often ensued in Latin America, when US intervention, however covert, however well-intentioned, went very badly wrong. To understand the context of Mitterrand's murder and the CIA back coup that led to it, we have to go back, back 150 years to 1823 and the Monroe Doctrine. The Monroe Doctrine was a policy established by US President James Monroe, and it formed the baseline for US Latin American relations ever since. Would anyone like to jump in and read the text on the slide here, starting with the American context and trying to sound as 19th century as possible? is absolutely that. There's a proclamation that the Americans <coughs> are free of European domination and also that European domination will never come back to the Americans. That um, Europeans are no longer permitted to intervene in Latin America specifically. This, is, uh, this was interpreted by some as a sign of US isolationism, the sense that we don't want external intervention in the Western Hemisphere. Later, it had been seen as a means to claim the Western Hemisphere as an American sphere of influence, excluding European powers. And it was issued right after the successful wars of independence in Mexico and South America. So it was aimed at warning off Spain from trying to reconquer these lost colonies. It was also aimed at excluding European powers from moving into the vacuum left by the Spain's expulsion. And this was actually a real danger. Mexico was actually conquered by France in 1861 during the US Civil War and uh, proclaimed as a, the second Mexican empire. It was a French duke that was placed on the throne of Mexico. So it was really more of a declaration of intent than anything else. Uh, the US wasn't able to enforce this doctrine because it didn't really have a military or naval presence in Latin America. But it would be invoked in the future by, um, from, by presidents from Theodore Roosevelt to Ronald Reagan against external influence, Soviet influence. And this was slightly ironic because of history there is always an irony. Because by the mid-19th century, the US had acquired territorial ambitions of its own in Latin America. And this relates into the territorial expansion phase of US-Latin American relations that we talked about. Specifically, this is about manifest destiny. The sense among um, 19th century Anglo-Americans that it was the divine mission of the American people to spread across the North American continent and spread civilization as they went along. The problem was that Mexico was in the way. It is important to note that Mexico was not a democracy at this time. It was a dictatorship. It was ruled by a general Antonio de Barua Maria Severino López de Santa Ana y Pérez de Lebrón. But it was a sovereign nation. Its northern territories included Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, California, and Utah. So it was a vast land. It was very sparsely populated with just a few tens of thousands of people. And it was a place that uh, American settlers were more and more moving into, especially into Texas because of the empty lands, in quotes, and also because of the natural resources that were abundant there. You probably know a bit about the Texan War of Independence. American settlers in Texas rebelled against Mexico in, um, in 1835 and won several battles, including at the Alamo. Uh, well, they lost the Alamo, but won every battle subsequent. So in, 19, in 1845, the US Congress voted to annex Texas which voluntarily entered the Union as the 28th state. This annexation infuriated Mexico and escalated border tensions to the point that in 1846, all-out war between the US and Mexico broke out and the US invaded Mexico. The fight in 
society culminated in the fall of Mexico City, the capital, and in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848, by which the U.S. annexed half of Mexico's national territory. Phenomenal feat of 15 billion dollars. It's only fair to note that many Americans were opposed to war, including Abraham Lincoln, who introduced anti-war resolutions in Congress during the 1840s. I also wanted to talk a bit about the filibusters. Filibusters were freebooters. That's the translation from filibusteros. They were American mercenaries and raiders, clean-shaven Vikings, as it were, and they led privately funded military expeditions to seize control of smaller Latin American nations. These expeditions were illegal under U.S. and international law, but the laws were seldom enforced by U.S. courts. And the most famous filibuster was William Walker, whom the newspapers at the time called the Gray-Eyed Man of Destiny. It's a testament to the chaos that beset Central America during the 1850s, though Walker was able to seize control of parts of Nicaragua and proclaim himself the country's president. One of you from Nicaragua. Ah, uh, uh, two of you. Well, you may be able to speak to some of this then. He proclaimed himself the country's president. His major achievement was reintroducing slavery, and he lasted one year before Costa Rica and a coalition of Central American nations, as you probably know, drove him out in 1857. And Walker was captured by Honduras and shot a few years later. And April 11, the date of the victory, against Walker, it's a national holiday in Costa Rica. And this is a monument to commemorate the victory. So just out of curiosity, how is, uh, is there any celebration of Walker's defeat in Nicaragua? Is there, are there holidays or monuments to your knowledge? No. That's intriguing because Costa Rica, which is actually a really good US ally, doesn't actually have an army and hasn't has abolished it decades ago, actually has made that national holiday. So even if you work for an American company in Costa Rica, you're still obligated to give you paid time off for that day to commemorate America's defeat. And a few years back, you hear leftists in Latin America invoking filibusters in, in speeches as evidence of US rapacity. Though again, this the filibusters were not agents of official U.S. policy. They simply embodied the territorial ambitions of the United States during the mid-1800s. So then we get to uh, something that's actually quite relevant to many of us here in Florida, Jose Martí. Jose Martí was a um, Cuban intellectual, journalist, and revolutionary. And he actually spent many years in New York City and in Ybor City, which is a Hispanic district of Tampa. New York and Florida were home to large Cuban exile communities long before Castro ever darkened history's doorstep. Tampa's Ybor City district is a prime example of this. My own uh, grandmother actually immigrated from Spain to Tampa during the 1930s. And it is important to note that U.S. Latin American not a simply a matter of the U.S. taking over. The U.S. was a beacon of liberty and democracy to many Latin Americans who were groaning under oppressive and impoverished regimes. A good case study is Jose Martí, who devoted his life to opposing Spanish colonial rule <coughs> over Cuba and had to flee into exile in the United States and join a large Cuban exile community here. Martí is particularly interesting because of his mixed so on the one hand, he saw American liberty and prosperity as a model for Latin America to follow. On the other hand, he saw that the US wanted Latin American land and resources, and he disliked what he saw as American materialism, the drive for more stuff, which now that we're coming up on the holiday season, it's been increasingly relevant for tea. Well, Sam Martí wrote the most one of the most important essays in Latin American history, Molested on America, Far America. And here's an excerpt from it. The disdain. 
Would any of you like to read this? So St. Louis for the Monroe Doctrine, this is actually a pretty complex statement. What is the point behind the <coughs> SMRT statement here? Or one of the points. Are you saying get to know your country? Say what? Get to know your country. There is an element of that, yes. Great participation, thank you. What's some of the imagery that Marti is using here? He's referring to um, North America, to the United States as he, and Latin America as she. What is the connotation there? What does that imply? Relationship, absolutely. What kind of relationship? Is it a relationship between equals? It's almost, uh, <coughs> it's interesting because he's constructing the U.S. Latin American relationship as predatory in some sense, as the North American man and laying hands on the Latin American <coughs> woman and exploiting her, exploiting her resources, her land, her people. And yet, he's saying that if North America is brought out of its ignorance, is educated about the unique qualities of Latin America, that the North Americans will um, come to respect Latin America and cease this process of exploitation. So this is in some ways a call for greater mutual understanding to reduce exploitation and conflict. As a side note, <clears throat> Jose Marti returned to Cuba in 1895 and was killed fighting Spanish rule. And he is an icon both to um, Castro loyalists in Cuba and to anti-Castro Cuban exiles in Miami. And there are statues of, of him in, uh, in both locations. This, by the way, is the, um, is the archway as you drive into Evil City. So that brings us to the Spanish-American War of 1893. So who can tell me just a tiny bit about the Spanish-American War? Who won? <coughs> the U.S. rarely loses a war. <laughs> the United States. It did definitely win. So what the U.S. got from this was Puerto Rico, which the U.S. still has. Guam, which the U.S. also still has and the Philippines, which the U.S. gave independence uh, some time later. <coughs> we also got Cuba, but we didn't keep it. Partly this was because of an anti-imperialist movement in the United States against annexation, plus the fear that Cubans were, because they were Spanish-speaking, and because they formed a very mixed population of both Afro-Cubans and traditional Spanish descent, they were seen as being impossible to assimilate. So the U.S. resolution was to establish a protectorate over Cuba. In other words, Cuba was left independent, but due to the Platt Amendment, the U.S. reserved the right to intervene in Cuban affairs and to uh, manage Cuban foreign policy. The Platt Amendment also granted the U.S. a permanent naval base at Guantanamo Bay, which is the origin of uh, Guantanamo Bay. Most importantly, the Spanish-American War ushered in three decades of regular U.S. interventions in Latin America, mainly to safeguard American commercial interests there. That brings us to the Roosevelt Corollary of 1904. And this brought us into the commercial and public order phase of U.S.-Latin American relations from 1900 to 33. 
This is, I love this cartoon. It's from an American newspaper in the early 1900s. This shows Roosevelt walking along the Mediterranean dragging a string of gunboats with a um, debt collector written on one of them. And he's carrying a big stick because one of his most famous statements is that he conducts foreign policy by walking softly and carrying a big, big stick. It's an interesting dynamic here because what Theodore Roosevelt did with this corollary, this follow-up statement to the Monroe Doctrine, was that the US would act as an international police power, that's a quote, intervening in Latin America in cases of, quote, chronic wrongdoing or an impotence, which results in a general loosening of the ties of civilized society. Any nation that keeps order and pays its obligations need fear no interference. So this is a policy of interventionism in a nutshell. It arose in response to Latin American nations defaulting under international debts. European powers would often send gunboats to Caribbean and Central American nations to force repayment of loans, which these nations were often too poor or too corrupt to repay. And Roosevelt wanted to uphold the Monroe Doctrine by keeping Europeans out of the Western Hemisphere. In order to do so, however, he made the US Marines into this international police force to restore order and to make the region safe and profitable for American and European investors and business interests who had come to dominate Latin America's export-based economies. So this led to long-term <coughs> interventionism. Uh, it's probably not profitable to go through the long list of interventions, so I'll just touch on a couple. Some of the big interventions were in Mexico in uh, 1914, when uh, US warships, under the direction of President Woodrow Wilson, bombarded and briefly occupied the Mexican port city of Veracruz. This really didn't accomplish much. It was in response to a uh, recent military coup that the US feared would jeopardize American interests. It was more about the United States sending a state. So briefly, before I get into the rest of Mexico, what is this cartoon indicating? <coughs> he's wearing boots and he's stamping on something. What is he stamping on? Snakes. Snakes, exactly. <coughs> These snakes are labeled bandit, rebel, revolutionary. This guy is, is Pershing, John Pershing. He was a he was an American general.